A new landmark property is coming to paradise. Opening in 2009, relish in your very own beachside villa, surrounded by luxury. Prepare to step into a resort and residence like no other. A bespoke pinnacle of opulence, built to last for generations. This is the Four Seasons Barbados. Welcome to Paradise, or more specifically, welcome to Paradise Beach. This was the location of one of Barbados' most promising developments, built by reputable developers with one of the most prestigious luxury hotel brands accompanying it. Celebrities and the ultra-wealthy bought into this slice of paradise, only for it to grind to a halt in 2009. Join me today as I venture inside the eerie bones of what would have been, meet the new residents of this quickly growing jungle, and unearth why this $300 million ultra-luxury resort has been left here abandoned. But to get there, we first need to go back. The site first saw hospitality use in the 1950s, when the Cunard Line had purchased the land and constructed a rather large resort. It was called the Cunard Paradise Beach Hotel, and through the 1980s, the company packaged it along with the Caribbean sailings of the Cunard Countess cruise ship. It would continue to operate under the Cunard name for a number of decades until 1992, when it would change hands a few times and ultimately close for good in the early 2000s. It actually sat abandoned itself for a number of years until it was sold to a group of new developers with big aspirations for this incredible stretch of beach. This one definitely burned. Oh yeah. Look at this, some of the pipe is just melted off. Yeah, look at all the nails. Since all the wood, oh, wow. since all the wood had burned away, you just have all these metal nails everywhere. Look at the brackets here that held together these wooden, uh, wooden roofs. It's fascinating, these. Custom, they must be. It's definitely an eerie, almost unsettling sort of place. It is a concrete jungle when it's all down to the bones here, mixed with an actual jungle. Four Seasons Hotels and Resorts first announced the project on January 17th, stating this hotel and residence facility would be the most lavish and opulent resort on the island. British developers Robin Patterson and Michael Pemberton were the two men primarily behind the project. Michael was already well experienced in hotel development and had been living on the island for the last 20 years. With a Scottish bank loan and the land in their possession, the developers began designing what this property might look like. 
Pemberton had an affection for Balinese architecture and built his home on Barbados already to reflect that. So when it came to designing the Four Seasons, they also went in this direction, creating a Balinese-inspired series of villas deriving several design cues from his very own private villa. The property would be split into two sections, a residence and a hotel portion. This is very common in destination ultra-luxury resorts, and the Barbados location would be no exception to this, listing over 40 luxury villas up on the market priced between $11 and $18 million each. Look at this massive, I think it's a retaining wall for the units that were gonna be on this tier, the third tier. Look, they didn't even finish the concrete pour in this section. Look at the barbed wires just completely destroyed by the foliage. And look at these ghost structures here. You know, 2009 and 2008, they don't seem like that long ago, but they really start to show its age when full-grown trees, well, maybe not full-grown trees, but thick foliage has just completely covered this whole foundation area. It's quite literally like a, a modern ruin lost in the forest here. Something I neglected to realize while filming this was the purpose of the styling facades on the side of this massive wall. These were actually test samples of trim and facade to see how they looked in person and how they held up in the weather. It's pretty hard to imagine that this was a road. <laughs> that residents were to drive their imported Mercedes, SUVs, and Range Rovers down this. <laughs> if you would believe it, this is where the resort was going to be. All of this land was cleared, at one point at least. And it is literally just a huge jungle now. It's hard to believe that this whole area was prepped for construction. While the private villas were far along in their construction, the same could not be said for the hotel portion of the resort. From the interior service roads all the way to the beachfront, the forest has now completely taken over. The whole site is pretty much unrecognizable of what it was going to be. Just a single lone building was built on the far side of the property. It was actually built as a test hotel room structure, constructed to see how a guest room would look and intended to be demolished once the hotel went vertical. Progress was moving steadily with land cleared and the site being prepped but focus was ultimately turned to the residence portion of the site to complete first. Since those were making money, and the further they got in construction, the more those wealthy owners had to put down more money. Which leads us to... Construction at the Four Seasons Barbados was well underway. Sales teams had marketed the ultra-luxury residences to the British elite, attracting buyers like Simon Cowell purchasing these two beachfront lots, as well as composer Andrew Lloyd Webber purchasing this one. Since the architecture was inspired by those found in Bali, many of the materials here were brought in from that part of the world. Batu Hijau green stone was brought in to line the pools and give it that special bluish-green color while coconut columns were used to hold up the walkway roofs, crafted from a certain type of tree found in Indonesia. Copper gutters were even fitted around the roof, which over time would patina, with teak flooring to be laid down in the bedrooms, and merbau wood fitted as the railings. Each unit would also have a selection of planters and reflecting pools filled with koi fish. 
While the villas were being built to the highest level of quality, the project was not without controversy. Locals on the island were questioning why workers from China were being brought onto the island to work on this project. The developers claimed that this was due to a labor shortage, and these Chinese construction teams had unique skills for this development. But even so, locals began questioning the legal status of those workers, which eroded some trust in the project and enraged others. But that was the least of their problems. By September of that year, the global financial crisis was starting to affect the nerves of almost every financial institution and their investments. The banks loaning money for this project had put a freeze on their investments. This meant any liquid cash on hand for the project quickly dried up, and by February 2009, the Four Seasons Barbados was put on hold. All employees were then laid off and sent home. Those Chinese workers left behind their temporary home, a large structure near the future site of the third tier of villas, not far from the main entrance and where all of the remaining materials were being staged. This is the top, the third tier of where the homes would have been. Concrete was poured here and it looks like you could see the staging for some of the materials that have been left behind here. And especially here, it's like metal joints or brackets for something. Yeah, even up here, the view is definitely not bad. That's for sure. Oh, what the? What was this? Well, uh... I bet someone, someone either killed their dog or <laughs> their dog died and they put it in a trash bag and they brought it out here. Well, that's suspicious. Yeah, that's a little creepy, huh? Yeah. Now there's just concrete pad up here with more disheveled construction supplies. You can see, it looks like these were insulation pipes or inserts for tubes and pipes and whatnot. It's so crazy to think that the archives of this place used to be in a room that has now completely collapsed in on itself and has a forest now growing through the office which stored all of the architectural drawings and blueprints and whatnot. Yeah, I think this was the, the workers' village where they housed all of their employees. Look at these rooms. Roof completely collapsed. Now a jungle forming over the roof. Looks like this one could have been the medical medical unit, the medical room in the village here. Yeah, this looks like it was a, a wash basin. Yeah, wash dishes. Wash dishes, wash shoes. Yeah, here's the proper gatehouse. Yeah, and you can see the gate mechanism right here, this yellow unit. Now just uh, do the trash pile. By January, things seemed to be getting back on track. Private investors, owners, and even the Barbadian government had all pledged money to get the project moving once again. 
By this point, the government alone had pledged $60 million to take a stake in the project and to help pay back most of the debts and spark further completion, which now meant a new opening date was set for 2012. The Prime Minister at the time had taken special interest in the project, emphasizing the gravity and urgency to bring a major brand like the Four Seasons to the island to help the local economy and tourism recover from the financial disaster. However, by this point, the 20 remaining owners who did purchase a villa were beginning to get cold feet, which meant a few of them would later withdraw. A myriad of lawsuits would spark from this followed, all while the government continued to inject time and money into the project, which critics say went nowhere and had nothing to show for it. Materials from within the villas, like the copper gutters and merbau railings, were looted, and a fire in 2018 ravaged the structures, destroying the roofs of at least three and a half buildings. By now, the corporation that the original developers had set up was dissolved, and the ownership for the land was disputed by the government of Barbados. This is Villa Number One, one of, if not the most completed of all of them. It really is like <clears throat> jungle in here, Jurassic Park. Step over this here. So, this would have been a living room area. Probably sconces all around these pillars here. What's so interesting about these villas, the residents here, is that these would have been open air walkways in between the property. And you have two little ponds here. Sort of like little, uh, a beautiful courtyard, I guess, if you will, inside your luxury villa. You can see though, look at the, Looks like this tree has battered the roof. It's completely coming apart. Solid timber, I think. It's uh, it's also in pretty good condition, all things considered, considering this has been battered by storms. It's really good quality wood. noises in here it's literally like uh, you're in like a massive forest which I guess it kind of is now this would have been the grand entrance and the road which you would have driven your car up and parked right here it's hard it's hard to even imagine that is spectacular. Wow. <laughs> it's, it's hard to believe something like this is abandoned. So this would have been all open air. This whole thing, just open air, open to the elements with these ostentatious, like, grand courtyards and ponds flanking the, the walkway with the the actual bedrooms and guest rooms and everything else around it. Man, this is a haunting sight. You could actually see where they began putting in the thatched theming elements of the roof. 
I think this whole room was going to be filled with that, this whole ceiling. It looks like they only put in one panel. This is so insane. So I believe up there is going to be the master bedroom. Actually see the privacy screen that they put in. But that's about it. At this point, the government has written off almost $125 million worth of investment into this project. While new development here is being touted year after year, the long blunder of failed promises is definitely a scar on this astonishingly beautiful beach. On one hand, this could have been avoided, with critics claiming that all levels of project management could have done better to proactively avoid defaulting and ultimately abandoning the project. On the other hand, those in charge of this resort clearly were passionate about what they were building, importing their love of Balinese architecture and building something of truly great craftsmanship to Barbados. Officials saw it as a landmark development, the largest ultra-luxury resort on the island. But instead, it became a notable landmark for a completely different reason. It's extremely rare to see a brand as prestigious as the Four Seasons fail, and even more rare for the bones of a once promising structure to sit like this for almost 15 years. I'll leave you with this deeply ironic and horribly aged quote from the original developers back in 2009, when they were asked if the developing recession had any effects on sales. They said, quote, What people tend to find with this development is security of the Four Seasons brand, because it is a Four Seasons hotel with residents, and it is not a block of condominiums. It is the strongest five-star global brand in the world, and people find it very comfortable putting their money into the strength of the Four Seasons. My name is Jake, and thank you very much for watching.